Well, welcome everyone, Tenakoto Katoa, and um, we're here to talk about the financial stability report. My name is Adrian Orr. I'm the governor of governor of the Reserve Bank, and for um, all the journalists in the room, you've got all of the authors sitting sitting here as well, so we can have a good conversation. I want to introduce uh, Bernard Hodgetts, who has been uh, heading up um, the whole area that is responsible for producing this report. Bernard, thank you very much. And uh, our Deputy Governor, Jeff Baskand, who is uh, who's responsible for the financial stability aspects of what we do at the bank. Uh, it's great pleasure that I am actually able to say that New Zealand's financial system remains sound. Uh, the banking system holds sufficient capital and liquidity, uh, which has creates a very good buffer for unanticipated shocks um, which can unsettle the banking system. Uh, I'd like to also say that these buffers, both liquidity and capital, have been guided by our own prudential regulatory requirements. Uh, an ongoing driver of financial soundness is the conduct and culture of banks um, and insurance companies. And these features are being at the moment jointly reviewed by both the Financial Markets Authority and ourselves. Um, it's work in progress and we do want to uh, keep our findings uh, in the public arena as we have done the work uh, on the way through. We are meeting, um, as is well known, with the Parliamentary Financial Expenditure Committee later this afternoon uh, with the Financial Markets Authority, so uh, I think it's useful if we keep most of the questions for that forum, uh, particularly when we have Rob Everett with us, um, the Financial Markets Authority CEO. In terms of the financial system vulner vulnerabilities, we do see them as being very much the same as when Bernard and team last produced um, the financial stability report. In particular, household, household mortgage debt remains very high, uh, but this risk has lessened somewhat. And we say that with both lending and house price growth having slowed over the last 12 months. In part, this is due to the imposition of the loan-to-value ratios that um, the bank imposed on the banking system, the Reserve Bank imposed. We think this more subdued lending growth needs to be further sustained uh, before we have the confidence to further ease the LVR um, restrictions ahead. So we will continue to watch the credit growth um, into the housing sector in particular and uh, the confidence around these more prudent lending um, behaviours continuing. In a similar vein, the dairy sector remains highly indebted and uh, the good news is most dairy farms are now cash flow positive, um, but they remain vulnerable to any price shocks that we've seen in the recent past and we believe that reducing these financial risks would be a prudent thing to be doing. So we have called on banks to continue their more prudent lending practices that we've observed over the last six months or so. Uh, the high dairy farm indebtedness and the fact that the bank has had to impose the LVRs really reflects banks' lending decisions. And we believe that some pursuit of short-term profits can lead to vulnerabilities in the longer term. And that is a really key part around the efficiency of the banking sector we'll be looking at, as well as um, the, the conduct and uh, consumer um, where the consumer sits in our banking reviews that we're doing. I'm now going to hand it over to uh, the Deputy Governor, Jeff Baskand. Jeff, do you want to stand or you? I'll, I'll sit here. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so today, oh, late yesterday, we launched the financial strength uh, dashboard and uh, very excited about having done that in terms of making it easier for financial information on banks to be compared. Information such as their capital buffers, non-performing loans, concentration of risk. Our aim is to improve the public's understanding of the banks, their banks' financial position and performance and hence uh, increase the incentives for banks to operate soundly. The banking sector appears to be broadly efficient, although, uh, as mentioned, some lending allocation appears a vulnerability. Major New Zealand banks are in the top quartile of OECD banks for their profitability when we measure that by return on assets. Bank services are widely available and wide-ranging, and they are at reasonable cost. 
These outcomes are possible in part due to the low cost to income ratios uh, of our major banks and the current low levels of impaired loans that improve their profitability. Turning to the insurance sector, <coughs> as a whole, it also seems sound, profitable and adequately capitalised, again supported by our prudential regulatory requirements. However, some insurers have relatively small capital buffers, uh, which gives them relatively limited scope to meet unexpected or extreme events. We're discussing these uh, situations directly uh, with those insurers. There are also challenges to the efficiency of some uh, parts of the insurance sector. Market shares concentrated in some uh, areas. Life, commissions, uh, life insurance commissions are particularly high, and this inevitably flows through into higher premiums. We believe te technological developments will be a key driver of competition in the future in improving the efficiency of the insurance sector. Namihi, thanks. So we're open to questions, um, and all the difficult ones can go to Bernard. Please. Um, you mentioned that subdued lending growth needs to be sustained for further before LVRs can be eased, and I was just wondering if you could flesh that out a little bit, how much longer until you're comfortable with easing that? Well, we'd be looking for at least the next financial stability report. So we use this as our main document for making those assessments, and it is still early days um, around the slower uh, credit growth that we've observed. A challenge for the banking sector is that you know, the LVRs bite on the marginal, the, the new loans. So it takes a long time before average risk levels start to become more comfortable. And just in terms of what the government's doing in an effort to um, curb rapid house price inflation, how would um, risk lo loosening um, LVRs work with that from your perspective? Uh, well, hopefully that uh, we'll be loosening LVRs because the financial stress um, well, vulnerability implied by those asset prices has eased. Um, the government's plans around further supply is, is part of that easing process. Hi, Emma Jolla from News Hub. Just um, on the dairy farms, you mention uh, Ambovis as an emerging risk. Um, how big a risk do you think it is? I mean, the coverage and the culling of cattle has been huge. Uh, it is. Um, I'll, 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 just a couple of points. One, emerging because this publication went to print uh, ahead of the government's announcements on Monday. So, but that we were certainly well aware and we were able to talk about that. How big a risk is it for the banking sector is different to how big a risk is it for farmers. Mm -hmm. And so this is a banking sector document. The loans that we've talked about here, the concentration of lending into the dairy sector, or the, the uh, it is, there are some highly vulnerable farms, but they are small in number in terms of the concentration, um, in terms of the number of farms. So highly concentrated debt amongst a few farms. Across here, in terms of financial sense, and uh, Bernard can, um, can kick in here, given what the government has announced, uh, in terms of dollars per kilogram of milk solid financial impact for farms, it is not that large in the immediate sense. Of course, longer term productivity and, uh, and all of the other challenges that are already in front of the agricultural sector, it all adds up to vulnerability. But the immediate impact of, of this, given the government and given the industry's um, st bodies being able to fund in part the 867 million talked about, uh, it comes around to about 15 cents per kilogram of milk solid in terms That's of... That's right, up, up to about 15 cents per kilogram. So a serious impact to farming, uh, not necessarily a serious impact to the banking system. Back on to the LVRs. If um, you're not looking at loosing them anytime soon, does that mean that the decision by the interim governor, Grant Spencer, to loosen them was a mistake? Uh, no, not at all. We've, we've, it's been um, very useful, actually, because the, uh, the credit growth had slowed and has remained slow, and we've been able to observe how banks have, have um, shifted their lending behaviour to the um, slightly less restrictive lending requirements. 
our challenge is around confidence is to think what would happen in the absence of those lending, you know, the loan to LVRs, loan to value ratios. Would banks go back to their uh, less prudent lending behaviours or would they have um, picked up a lesson? So, you know, that's going to be an iterative process for us. So what's your gut feeling about what the banks would do? Yeah, I mean it's a great question. Um, hence my anticipate, you know, my I'm, you know, my angst around this. That's why we're just sitting there. Uh, I think part of this bank conduct review will be an interesting time to talk about um, their lending horizons. Uh, Governor, house price inflation has ticked up a bit since you. Um, eased the LVRs earlier this year, and I'm wondering where you see that going from here on, because normally you'd publish forecasts in the NPS and they weren't there this time, so we're just keen to get a bit of a, a view uh, uh, on where you see house price inflation going from here. I'm struggling to recollect. Did we? Yeah. I thought we had produced house prices, but oh, we certainly did produce them. Whether we uh, published right, the, the detail in the NPS, I can't recall either. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the the general picture is we have a, um, a very moderate uh, house price outlook. Uh, you're you're correct that there's been a, a little bit, or there was a period of a little bit of reacceleration, but then the April numbers were also quite soft again, and and so. That's been a little bit of our weariness. Is, is you know how uh, resilient, how robust is the the slowing, um, how how protracted uh, outlook over the next uh, few years. We think um, a, a moderate price track, um, a few um, two three percent, is the sort of average we expect to get back to. But it, you know it's a little bit above that now. One of the most um pleasing things for us has been the shift in um, the new loans uh, for away from investor to, um, to owner-occupiers. And so that itself means that even with the, with the higher restrictions, the LVRs, uh, new home buyers, owner-occupiers are still able to access the market, but the investor market is the one that has been really changed, and that has been the most vulnerable component in terms of financial stability. I should add that the uh, slight tick up in house price inflation hasn't been uh, accompanied by an increase in credit growth. Um, credit growth, if anything, has continued to sort of ease off over the course of the year. So that gives us a little bit more comfort that it's not a, a fundamental uh, acceleration. Yeah, and activity was also relatively low. So we saw the prices jump on relatively modest house sales activity, again, sort of causing us to be uh, not too uh, concerned with it. Say that um, last year was one of the most costly on record for weather-related insurance claims. I mean, do you do you expect that that area of risk will increase over time, and might it become an uh, an area of some regulatory focus? And I'm thinking particularly of the link between insurability and mortgages and the security of loans in the banking system. Um, I, I believe globally, it's becoming. <laughs> A real challenge. I mean, this um, you know weather-related impacts on insurance has been a, a global issue. It's a deep and liquid market globally. Um, reinsurers are prepared to be in there. We haven't gone any further around considering uh, what role a regulator would play, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, there's certainly you know longer term. We've got to think about climate change impacts on on both banks and insurance. Uh, there are sectors that are quite exposed. Um, so I think your, your question is pointing to to some of those. Uh, potential vulnerabilities there in a, a long-term sense is correct. Uh, insurers have different ways of managing that. Some of them are, are uh, to restrict coverage, if you like. We're facing that with, with earthquake um, uh, zones, so to speak. Uh, others is more risk-based pricing uh, in areas that are, um, are more exposed. So I think the, the sector itself is, is having to work through quite a number of of uh, you know challenges to it, and and something we've got to watch closely for its um, wider financial sector impact. But in the meantime, you're happy that um, the estimation of liabilities and the capital buffers are adequate. In that sense. Well, as we indicated, we think some of the buffers are small. Uh, everybody is meeting their minimum requirements, but but this is the discussion that we need to have with them: is how much uh, resilience have they got to to the um, extreme event, uh, the 
obviously they're, they're insuring against some expected loss all the time, uh, of a, sort of a pattern of loss, but if you get growing patterns or much more severe effects, then the buffers in some insurance cases look a little um, small, and uh, that's a discussion we're having with them. Can I just ask you about Westpac's non-compliant risk management systems? Um, are you concerned that Westpac is still using the non-compliant internal models? And given that it was deemed so grave a risk that you changed uh, Westpac's uh, capital uh, obligations, is it acceptable that it's not going to be compliant until 2019? Uh, yeah. Acceptable, yes, that is a fact. They're working on it. Um, uh, and they are currently operating under a higher capital ratio than what they otherwise would be. So they have got a, they are highly incentivised to um, to get it sorted. Yeah, we agreed a timetable with them. Just to add to the governor's um, remarks, there, uh, a timetable that gave both them and us uh, time to uh, um, get the documentation. Um, on the models prepared, uh, submitted for us to review them to agree with it, whether those uh, models are uh, satisfactory in terms of requirements. So we always knew that was going to take a, a period of time. Uh, they've been submitting models to us and we're working through that. So uh, yeah, the capital is a, a protection, if you like, the additional capital protection and assurance for us mm. through that period of time to make sure that if the models were underperforming, that we've got a bit more buffer there. Is the you know allows them to remain non-compliant until next year? Uh, technically, yes, it's uh, yeah they're, they're correct, but um, no. but un under notice of breach and and an active steps to get into compliance, which is what we're working yeah. through with them. Can I also ask you about the BNZ outage mm -hmm. over the weekend? Um, do you have any concerns about the Australian-owned bank's implementation of the outsourcing policy? Uh, oh. Talk off the cuff first around you know it is it is an excellent example of the vulnerability the operational vulnerability of banks full stop. Um, it is one of those trade offs where efficiency versus certainty. Um, so you know we try ourselves to balance both that soundness and efficiency in our uh, regulatory behaviours. Um, the challenge, of course, here is is. How certain is enough? And in particular, what are your business continuity plans? Um, in this case, you know, were they aware and ready enough to have uh, independent business continuity plans that could manage for that particular risk? But we have got a very, very big work program ahead of us around making sure that banks, uh, systemically large, important banks, are operationally capable on their own within New Zealand. Um, you, you cite household debt as New Zealand's largest vulnerability in the report. What impact will rising interest rates have overseas have on New Zealand household debt if that does eventually incur? Well, of itself, an increase in interest rates, uh, you know, we think the household sector can, can probably cope with that. Um, the issue really comes about if we get an abrupt uh, change in interest rates, and I guess there are some borrowers out there we know who have you know, relatively high levels of indebtedness, high debt to income uh, multiples. Uh, those are the sort of borrowers who could potentially struggle if interest rates were to move up abruptly. And we talk in this document about the risks that could occur if, if uh, markets do uh, react, uh, you know, dra dramatically to uh, the tightening in monetary policy that we're seeing around the globe. Uh, so that, that's uh, certainly a risk that we're, we're very conscious of. But you know, the, the, the general cyclical lift in interest rates, as long as it's orderly, uh, we think the household sector generally can cope with it. So how, cons or what, how likely do you think it is that there is going to be this, in this shock increase of uh, monetary policy tightening in places such as the Fed or the ECB and such? It's well, it's, not our, it's certainly not our central projection. It's just a risk that we're, we're very conscious of um, as part of the, the sort of general tightening that's going on. And I'd just like to add, I think, you know, there's, there's good tightening and bad tightening. 
good tightening is if the central banks are gradually raising interest rates because economic activity in those countries is behaving as they currently project, i.e. improving economic growth, which means wider financial system soundness. Um, and those are well signalled and those are our central projections. The bad tightenings are, for example, as happened overnight, you know, with regard to Italian elections, where suddenly markets get spooked and you see risk premium jump and then that leads to other types of contagion effects. Um, those probabilities are very small. They're not part of central projections, but they are the ones that we really need to be able to weather through, which is why we talk about the liquidity ratios and the capital buffers. And I think one of the most pleasing things in this document outside of the cartoons is the increase in the liquidity ratios of our banks, you know, both in terms of the duration of <coughs> borrowing they're doing, they're, they're borrowing capital offshore for longer periods of time, and the proportion of domestic deposits versus offshore borrowing to fund their business. You know, and that has been, you know, r relatively expensive for them. They've had to pay higher deposit rates and, and have deposit competition to increase the onshore um, borrowing they're doing through the deposit base rather than just um, feeding off short-term international borrowing. So that is, that is a fantastic movement. Um, which makes us feel more comfortable about, about the ability for the banks to weather um, un unanticipated events. But specific households, you know, caveat emptor, think very hard about what you're borrowing and what your leverage is. Just on a slightly different note, what's your take on adding debt to income restrictions to the Reserve Bank's toolbox? Uh, we are positively pursuing them through part of the Reserve Bank uh, review of our legislation. You know, we really do want to get our heads around it. Um, if it's a tool where no one's worse off, someone may be better off, then we would like to add it um, to our to our potential, well, to our toolkit. Hi, Governor. Uh, you, you just mentioned the Italian bond rise overnight, and we've got uh, emerging markets around the world. Um, you know, so New Zealand's fundamentals may remain sound, but as you mentioned, there could be a jump in risk premium. Are you worried that that sort of event is closer than it perhaps was when you did the MPS at the beginning of the month? Uh, no, not worried that it was closer. I mean, we talked about this very clearly as, as a risk. In fact, we dedicated a whole couple of paragraphs to it, I think, around the types of risks and shocks that can knock us off our central forecasts. A lot of what this document is about is our preparedness to manage those risks as opposed to whether we can predict those risks because we can't. Um, and, you know, as you've seen as recently, I mean, last week, no one asked us a question about the Italian bond market. That's how quickly these things can arrive. I don't know what I'm going to be asked about tomorrow, but I can tell you that we are well capitalised in our banking sector and have good liquidity ratios. So, you know, we're in a better position than what we were um, the last time this happened, you know, which was about 2011, wasn't it? Um, when we right. saw, yeah, yeah 12. The banking system's in better place, the European economies are in better place. Um, uh, you know, we are in a more solid place. Does that mean that these events won't happen? No. Um, how, how unusual is it and how sustainable is it for New Zealand interest rates to be lower than US ones, more or less all along the curve? Is that a concern? Uh, it's not a concern. Um, uh, you know, in fact, it's something we should be you know, think, well, hopefully there's good reasons why that's happening. You know, that our economy has been performing well and people are pricing our risk appropriately, um, you know, through that behaviour. There's both structural and cyclical reasons behind it, and it's primarily the cyclical reasons that are driving the difference at the moment. They are starting on their interest rate tightening. We aren't. Uh, as well as the Royal Commission into Banking in Australia, there's also intense scrutiny at the moment on, their, on, the, on the bank's risk profiles. Um, they're the most exposed to residential property in the world. Uh, and there's about $360 billion of mm. interest-only loans expiring over the, <coughs> over the next few years. Um, does that concern you with them being uh, parents of, uh, of the New Zealand major banks? Uh, yes, it does, which is why we talked about it explicitly in this document. Um, you know, we have to be aware of what types of shocks could knock us off our perch 
We are small, we are as highly indebted in household sectors, and we're highly concentrated on our borrowing through the banking sector. And so these are exactly the types of transitions or transmissions that could that can cause um, sudden lending concerns from our own banks, um, you know, the New Zealand registered banks, particularly if they're also owned by the same capital. I'd say positively, and Jeff, you might want to talk about what APRA themselves have been doing around the lending standards. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly it's been a focus of, of APRA's attention in Australia with uh, restrictions on interest-only lending that they were previously applying. I mean, they've been, in a sense, transitioning that to a broader focus on prudential lending standards and, make, and trying to uh, ensure that the banks are, are lending uh, responsibly, prudently, and, and managing those risks. So, yeah, it's, there is a close interaction, as the Governor has said. We watch that, and we think some of that spills over into our own lending practices. I think we've seen some of that probably tightening in our own uh, credit uh, practices here as a result of the parents' um, uh, relationships with APRA and, and, and those practices uh, flowing through the, the sub, uh, subsidiaries. It's a continuous challenge, uh, you know, forever in this industry, chasing the short-term profit um, in a competitive environment. Uh, you know, is it the marginal or final loan is the one that tips over and then we all start again? You know, trying to get a, a longer-term horizon around the responsible lending uh, the consumer at the end is really um, what we're about and, um, and what we'll be talking to the banks a lot about through this uh, conduct review. I think there's just one. <laughs> um, yeah, just a quick question about the open banking resolution, the fact that uh, term deposits can actually be uh, subjected to a haircut. Um, do you think that most New Zealanders are aware that that is a possibility, however remote it may be? Uh, I'll go back to a gut feeling. Um, no, I don't think they are aware because it's very, very hard to communicate these types of issues to an audience that is, you know, not thinking about those types of risks. And that's why we spend so much effort around both our market discipline and our self-discipline and the way we try and explain and talk about these things. But they are relatively esoteric events. I will say that part, you know, what we'll be thinking hard about in the future, we being the wider uh, review of the Reserve Bank Act, is about how to make that much clearer and how to have some type of deposit of protection base in there um, to, so that people can understand uh, what they will have access to, but also understand what risk they are at. Uh, these banks can fail. So do you think perhaps the bank hasn't been uh, active enough in making sure that people are aware of this in the past, and what specifically could you do to improve that? Yeah, I, I believe we can always communicate this better, and we need to um, work at it harder. It's been an interesting one for the bank over the last 15 years. I'm looking at Toby, you were a young man with a full head of hair when we started. Um, um, the, um, fortunately the camera can't see you there, Toby. The, um, he's just there. The, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, you know, the, the real challenge with it has been both policy development and negotiation with the banks and all of the right regulatory ways we do it, as well as policy implementation. Mm -hmm. And so that development and working the way through has been a very long and difficult period, and I would like to think we're coming towards an end conclusion of it, where it can be embedded. In between time, stuff happens, you know, global financial crises where, central, where the central government immediately underwrote banks all around the world. And so, you know, open bank resolutions was put on the back burner for a while again. But it has highlighted, highlighted the importance of having plan B. And so, you know, that's given us more confidence and I'd say determination to make sure plan B is completed. And yes, shout from the rooftops. That is why um, Jeff mentioned the, the dashboards, you know, the, uh, our uh, financial strength dashboard. People can go on and start comparing, contrasting, both in a relative and absolute sense, the stability of their banks. In the um, conversations that you're having with the insurance sector, are you looking at lifting the minimal capital requirement? Uh, we don't have a policy review specifically on that. Uh, we've got 
uh, individual supervisory discussions with insurers. I think there is something to look at in future, maybe, um, as to whether we need some buffer type uh, provision. We'll, we'll have to think about that. But, you know, it, it's the, the policy is there to, to make sure that they cover the, ex uh, have reserves to cover the expected losses. And the question is, how do you deal with something extraordinary? How much room do you have? And, and so, uh, yeah, it's an open question as we look at that. And But certainly for, for those insurers who seem a little closer to the margin at the moment, it's a conversation with them. Are, how are they managing the risks that are before them? Wonderful. Are we all done? Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And thank you very much, team, for producing this excellent document. All the very best.